Good evening, I'm Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard, and this is your week five. Let's just get right into it, everyone. Thank you for sharing your Friday evening with me. And we are just gonna get right into it. All right. And so Marlette has the pleasure of being the name that I see underneath my name. So let me ask you, just nod your head. Do you see my notes? Okay. I think, I don't know. I think um, I have two monitors. It's not like a boot. It's, you can get it like at Amazon for 50 bucks. And I think that's what was going on. I don't know. I don't know. So this is your chapter 18 and 19. Let's just delve into it, people. So starting off with sedatives. Sedatives, usually they're ordered nine times out of 10. They're treating some type of sleep disorder, insomnia. Then you have sedative, a class called sedative hypnotics. And the sedative hypnotics are usually, usually ordered for folks when they're trying, they're, the providers are trying to reduce tension and anxiety, trying to calm. They could have hypnotic hypnosis, quieting, calming the person. That's usually when the sedative hypnotic is ordered over your general, your sedative, okay? And then... Moving on, I'm admitting some folks. Now we're going to delve into deeper into your sedative hypnotics first. So your side effects of this class of medication, again, if you understand what it's doing, reducing the anxiety, calming you, then there are folks that will experience drowsiness or even a hangover. They may say that they have these weird dreams. I don't know if you've ever had a family member is like, you know, I just started dreaming something like giants with elf ears or something like really weird. It has like usually that type of effect, nightmares even, drug dependence because of that medication action. If it's something that you're using for a very long time, your body can become dependent on it and tolerant to it, that it wants to have it even when the prescription is over. Excessive depression, especially if it's during withdrawal, if they have withdrawal symptoms, because it does have that dependence type of factor to it. You're going to be super careful. Um, well, you're never going to order it, but it can have that effect to where the body gets used to it. And hypersensitivity, and hypersensitivity, when I think of that, it usually means is that it doesn't give you the effect that it usually does when you initially started it, because your body becomes used to it over a period of time. Now, barbiturates, you may have heard that term before. Now we're going to go into the classes of the sedative hypnotics. Remember the calming, the anxieties, reduced tension sort of thing? There's a long-term barbiturates, there are intermediate, intermediate, and then there's short acting. So just know that there's different classes of them. You want to try, and again, they're saying all this as if you're prescribing it, but in a perfect world, we want folks to be on this class of medications for the shortest amount of duration, the lowest dose possible, because we already know what's going to happen because we don't want them to have those side effects, especially with the drug tolerance and, and um, sort of thing. And usually you will, usually you will see it for a short term, two weeks or less. Want to be careful because again, knowing those side effects, you want to do your education and teaching. Do not drink. That's how you'll hear about certain people, stars that are taking this with that and this with tequila and then they accidentally overdosed and that sort of thing. So you want to do your education and teaching. You also want to, again, you, you're wanting to know what medication folks are on. So you know that with this class of medication, your oral anticoagulants, like your blood thinners, your glucocorticoids, your steroids, 
and certain antidepressants are going to negatively impact the drug and interact with it and not in a positive manner. It's going to cause things to happen that is not what was intended for because they're mixing things. Um, your benzodiazepines, excuse me, one second, you guys. Okay. Your benzodiazepines, these are a class of your medications that are usually for sleep and anxiety. Okay. Again, there's certain classes of medications you want to use for sleep. There's certain classes you want to use for calming. There's certain medications you want to use if you're trying to have someone that's has trouble sleeping and they're anxious. I mean, there's there's a variety of different hypnotics, sedative hypnotics out there. Lorazepine is really, 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 really common. Diazepam is extremely common. Those two are like old school, like old school. And they interact because they are actually working with that neurotransmitter GABA, which is a long name for, I don't remember the long name of it, but it works specifically with that neurotransmitter. So I would memorize that to reduce that neuron's excitability. So it, it's calming that neuron down is what it's doing. It's reducing anxiety and treating insomnia. And then we are going to look at the indications. So this is the list of indications commonly used for benzodiazepines. Sometimes it's used as a um, alcohol and drug medication. Sometimes folks, and that's usually in a specialty clinic. Often in your med surge land, you're giving it to folks because they have an anxiety disorder, insomnia. Usually that's when I've seen it. And again, it can be used in combination with other medication classes as well. But usually that's what it's for. Folks that have anxiety before surgery, some people get really worked up over surgery. And so they need that to reduce their anxiety for that period of time so that their body can chill and react, relax, and let the surgeon do their job and let their body relax and know that everything's going to be fine. And you got to be careful when you're um, when you're working with benzodiazepines because of withdrawal and side effects. You see the list of side effects just for this medication alone. Shortest period of time to get the job done and possibly consider another medication. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've actually, hey, cutie, the number of times I've actually needed to give embezodiazepine. I mean, I already know the side effects and everything, and I will try to pull from something else first and get them to a specialist. Uh, folks that are used to, they know the different drugs that are out there and they know the interactions and all of that. And then you actually have sedative hypnotics that are non-benzodiazepines, okay? This is a newer class of medication. They're the new kids on the block, if you guys remember that particular band or not, all right? They're the new school, all right? Lower tolerance, fewer side effects. Again, you, we still want to use them for less than 10 days, if at all possible, helps you with your sleep quality. Also, um, you know, it can last for six to eight hours. So anytime I'm looking at a class of medications and, you know, you're learning about them, I'm automatically thinking six to eight hours. So if I have to be to work at six o'clock in the morning, I don't want to try to take it at midnight. You know what I mean? Just different things. They may not make it clear for you, but you just, that's that critical thinking that's going to eventually come into play. Benadryl is a non-benzodiazepine. It is. Atarax is, Enderol. I don't know if you've heard of Enderol. So you have your, your different classes here, but your antihistamines, that's where you'll see, I don't know, especially in med surge, you know, sleeping pill, they'll have Benadryl. Oh, the doctor will order Benadryl because they know it's one of the new kids on a block and has fewer side effects. And your patient might be like, why are you giving me Benadryl? Well, yeah, it's an antihistamine, but you can use it for 
you'll find out you can use medications for more than one different reason. It's not linear. You can go this way with it, this way with it. You can go so many different ways with it. But then you have your side effects such as drowsiness, memory impairment, nausea, and withdrawal symptoms. And usually if you're using, I always tell folks, if you're using a medication outside of how it was intended, you are gonna likely nine times out of 10, you're gonna run into problems. If I have patients that are like, I gotta have my Benadryl. No, you don't got to have anything. You need food, clean water, air, good air. That's what you need. You don't need, need that. Now we're going into melatonin agonists. And you can see that your melatonin agonists, I have not personally ever seen Ramelton, um, Tion. It's listed here, so I wouldn't know it. It's the first hypnotic non-classified as a controlled substance. So this is one that is the first hypnotic that is not classified as a controlled substance, which is, means it's not on that level with your um, temazepam or what we looked at pre previously. The controlled substances usually are ones that are very heavily regulated. You have Big Brother looking into how often you're, you have to have a certain prescription classification when you're a provider, like, what am I thinking of? Um, like, do I want like peyote? It's a prescription. I would never in my life give it. But there are certain things that are, that are at that level of controlled substance that I don't care if you give me a million dollars. My name will not be attached to it. So they they came up with a, a medication that is actually a hypnotic and it's not a controlled substance, which is good. It targets the melatonin receptors. Remember, they love these receptors. Open the door and let me in and regulate circadian. That's circadian, your sleep cycles. So that's how it works. It's actually tapping on that receptor melatonin receptor that has to do with your sleep rhythm, your circadian rhythm. There's always going to be side effects. And then it's just like when you see those commercials and then like may cause, and it says it really fast, may cause death. <laughs> but there's nothing without side effects. And you have to be careful with older adults. Well, they're very old and they're very young, but this slide that uh, they have listed here is talking about older adults again because they you want to always pull from non -pharm non pharmacological anything that has to, not to do with the medication and that includes your cams that in called included in medication it doesn't specifically say here but anytime something says non pharmacologic it's not a considered a medication in any form. And people forget, are you drinking coffee for sleep? I know people that drink coffee 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're, they're happy with three hours of sleep. And I'm like, um, don't drink coffee before sleep. Uh, exercise tends to help some people relax. Acupuncture, sleep hygiene, anything. Sleep hygiene means that you, or I like to tell my patients, a sleep diary or sleep, um, I don't know, I can use different I could use different adjectives, but the whole point is, is that sleep routine. You're in bed every night by nine o'clock. You're not up watching Game of Thrones. You're not drinking coffee before bed. You're winding down. You're not watching anything like that's going to give you nightmares or something like that. Just, just get to know your body and make your so your body gets used to, you know, like when you put your kids down for sleep, they know it's bedtime at a certain time and they're used to that and their bodies are off to sleep by a certain time and 20 minutes later. But just know that they're the short and intermediate acting are the ones that we really want to work with with our adult, older adults. It tends to have less of a long term, well, less of a long term um, side effects with them. I tend to see those short term ones used um, more often. You want to avoid benzodiazepines and they list them here for you. These certain ones, I don't think I've ever given to like someone when I worked in a nursing home. Um, and then again, I remember, gosh, I remember was LPN doing my associates level. And I used to hate to work the floor when I had to be the one to 
um, tell them that this is their holiday night, that I couldn't give them their sleeping pill. Oh, you want to see old people going off? I'm like, no, this is your rest night. Remember, it's every four, every four nights. That's how you avoid all of those side effects. They don't want to hear it. They know it's coming, but I'm like, oh, why does that have to be me? Because that's after dinner and you give them their baths. They're ready for bed like at 730. And um, yeah. All right. So then going into clinical judgment with your um, sedative hypnotics, your non-benzodiazepine, you want to observe if you know the side effect is that they're going to have dizziness and confusion, you want to watch for those side effects, but just be observant of it as well. If, you know, if they're trying to, they're saying they want to get out of bed or they want to go do something, you just, you want to let them know, put on your call light, you know, I just gave you this medication. So if you need anything, please don't hesitate to give me a call. Do not do this. Do not drink have caffeine and you're always educating and making them aware of things. Um, and then you want to evaluate the effectiveness of anything. Anytime you give something pain pill, it was a 10. Now it's an eight. If they're saying it's a 12, you need to be on the phone with the doctors. Like this is not working. I need something. They need something. Now the anesthetics, the medications that put you to sleep, you've, Mostly of you, hopefully you've heard of general, if not, that's where you are um, usually intubated, well, you are intubated and they're giving you medication to completely put you out. It depresses your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, and you are out. It alleviates pain, your lo loss of consciousness. That's your general. Local, local is like if you go to a dentist and they give you your lidocaine or give you an injection um, to help you go to sleep. I mean, not help you go to sleep. My goodness. Sorry, I'm multitasking. Someone wants me to admit them. Okay. Um, so local, local means it's pain relief in that particular area. Wherever you are injected is where that action is going to happen. Then you get into your, um, your they call it balanced anesthesia, may include hypnotic given. Sometimes folks are given a prescription for to take the medication the night before. Uh, they are pre-medicated with a opioid analgesic or a benzo, just depends. Um, like someone given an atropine before surgery to decrease secretion. So this is when you're giving medic pre-medication in advance. Um, and that's extremely common. They give you the medication in your IV, right? As they're, they're willing you into surgery. Uh, but that's your balanced anesthesia, meaning that you're trying to prepare their body prior to them going to sleep. Propanol is your short-acting barbiturate, someone with the last name Jackson, overdosed, or that was the medication that they found in his system. And then you have inhaled gas, which is usually nitrate, a combination of oxygen and nitrous oxide. Uh, usually see that in, I don't know, maybe in dental. I haven't really seen that much lately, maybe in sp your specialty clinics. Uh, then your muscle relaxant, muscle relaxant is given as needed as well. Just relax that, relax those muscles and get people. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get people to calm and relax before surgery. Um, and then, guys, let me. And then again, you. Why am I going backwards? Hang on, I'm getting there. All right, click the wrong button. Before surgery, you're always assess you're always assessing your patient. It doesn't stop when you do your head to toe. Even when you're answering their call light and you're putting them in bed, you're straightening up their bed sheets. You're always observing. I call it observing, observation, assessing. For surgery, my eyes prior to surgery. Oh, will somebody give me a little kissy on my little cheeky? Right here, right here. Age any their health status, health disorders, anything that they're dealing with. And usually there's a pre-op sheet. It's not like you have to memorize this. Pregnancy, that's important to know. History of having, I think everybody gets a pregnancy test unless they're like 80 or something. You can tell them you have a tubal. They're going to still check your pee. 
history of heavy smoking, use of alcohol and drugs. So these are common things that common variables that are that are asked before surgery. And then that after all of this information is given to the surgeon and anesthesiologist so they can make decisions. If somebody's pregnant, they need emergency surgery. So they're going to need to know certain things. And then um, your anesthetic routes include inhalation, breathing in, they're putting it in your IV, topical, which means that they're applying it on top of your skin, local, which means, which is that injection into the, into the, the teeth. And spinal, spinal was actually like mm, an epidural. It's a, it's a spinal before uh, when you're in labor and delivery. So your inhal inhalation anesthetics, these are the, the names that are listed here for you. I'm not going to read them all. It's on the slide. Um, provide smooth induction, which means that it works with those, with your lungs and just works it just while you're breathing it in, it just helps get into your your circulation and your lungs and just kind of make kind of calming things down. Usually it's a combination of a but it says they're non barbiturate such as propanol, and they're mixing different things together and uh, analgesics such as morphine. And there's usually there's some type of cocktail going on. I've never prescribed an inhalation anesthetic. I tend to stick to local and topical in my realm. But in surgery land, these are things to be aware of because you might want to be a circulating nurse or what have you. Knowing how the action works, adverse effects should make sense to you, such as respiratory depression, which means your respirations are going from 20 to 16 or 10. I remember when I had surgery once and I'm not going to get into the details too much, but I like to ask questions. I just, I'm like, oh, well, I'm never going to get a chance to like really interview this anesthesiologist without obviously asking him. I said, what would make you nervous as far as someone's respirations were to decrease? I said like 10. He's like, no, four. I'm like, four. He's like, that makes me nervous. 10 doesn't make me nervous. I can do something about 10. I'm like, oh, all right. I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, but somebody's respiration dropped from 20 to 10. In a doctor's office, one thing, but if you're in a surgery suite, I'm sure they can pop something in your IV, atrophine, something to make your heart rate, epinephrine, I guess, but anyway. And um, your intravenous anesthetics that are listed here for you as well. Ketamine is, is very common. They have ketamine clinics, but I'm not going to get into that. You can use medications for different things, but it's a rapid onset, which means it works quickly, but it's, the action is short term as well. It's going to get in there. It's going to get the job done. Um, I don't think that would be used for like a long surgery case, like open heart surgery. I don't know, but... I'm always thinking, okay, it's going to be a surgery that's not going to last long, and I need it to work right this second. Um, I think of like kids, but I don't know. Again, I just like, hmm, what would I use that for? And then these are, again, mitazole, zolam, and propofol. You know, that word keeps coming up. I'm just saying I would look at the pattern that they're showing you here. All right, so we use the induction, induce, and to maintain anesthesia or conscious sedation. So again, again, they're looking, for example, looks like they would use etomatate along with, let's say, profanol or what have you. That's what happened when Michael Jackson was mixing profanol with something. But profanol was found in his system. So the respiratory and cardiac depression you don't want that CPR. You don't want anything that's got to be careful. That's going to suppress your lungs, your breathing, and your heart. Um, then your topicals. Anybody that's had dental surgery or sutures or that sort of thing as well. You can use different solutions, um, liquid sprays, lidocaine spray. If you go out and use lidocaine spray or um, icy hot, that's topical. Cream, gel, powder, not everything is prescription. Diclofenac, 
decreases the sensitivity of your nerve endings in that area. So if you're having pain in your knee, then you're going to apply it to your knee, not your elbow. Yes. Where if you're doing something when your IV is going to calm everything down. So your local anesthetic is going to block the pain where the drug is given. That's the local. That's the key term there. You're awake. You're conscious. You know what's going on. You can talk to people when you're having suturing, dental surgery as well. Um, regional blocks, that's an example of somebody that's getting work done, let's just say on their toe, like when they were moving a toenail as well. And then um, there are actually two groups. There's esters and amides. And amides have a very low incidence of allergic reactions. So your procaine, your hydrochloride, Lidocaine is very, 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 very common. It's a rapid onset, um, longer duration of action, and causes fewer hypersensitivity reactions than procaine. I don't think I've ever, 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 ever. We have nine. I have. I'm sure procaine is out there, but in like 99.9% .9 of the time, you go to a doctor, you go to a dentist, they're giving you lidocaine injections in your teeth. I'm sure procaine is out there, but I've never personally given it. And then your spine anesthesia, that's your, again, it's showing you that it's local anesthesia injected into your subarachnoid space in your lumbar spine. So for adults, they're telling you specifically it's below the first lumbar space. And then the children, it's below the third lumbar space. And your side effects and adverse reactions like respiratory depression, headaches, and hypertension are also common. This is a medication, again, that's going into your, injected into your subarachnoid, which, which you know, your brain, your spinal co column. They're connected. So you have spinal blocks, you have epidural blocks, you have cardio blocks, and you have saddle blocks. So your spinal blocks are ones that penetrate into the subarachnoid space your um and your epidural blocks again we've heard of epidurals uh, it goes into different spaces this one goes into your epidural space all righty so this is all your spinal column where do you where are you trying to place that medication and again certain medications are designed if they're a spinal block they're not going to be used for a saddle block think of saddle block like the area where you sit saddle your cardio is your sacral, so your sacral spine. And then your epidural, that's probably easy to remember because that's if any of, any of us have had kids, they're doing an epidural block. And then spinal block, um, can't think of when that would probably be used for the subarachnoid space, maybe more for like if they're doing spinal surgery. I would say probably a laminectomy. I don't think you have to know that personally, but no, there's different ways to address that spinal column and nerve. Depends on what you're doing to that person. So your anesthetics is intraoperative care. So care before you go in, it starts before you go into the operating room. And then of course, you're going to get your drug history, your health history, get all of that information. And you're collecting all of that information and you're charting it so that that anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist you guys can be a nurse and that's if that's what you want to do one day. They are aware. They're going to want to, that, that's going to be ordering it. But if anybody gets sued, everybody's name goes on there from the nurse to the circulating nurse to the operating room nurse to this nurse to doctor, the doctor, the people, because everybody was responsible for that medication. So you want to get your careful history. You're helping the team. And then... Um, you're analyzing again, you're, you're observing, you're asking for pain, rating their pain. You're asking about um, airway, you're acting. So if someone has um, airway obstruction, that would be, I would think like if they have COPD, history of asthma, something of that nature, but you're documenting all of that. You're asking all of those questions. Um, and then you're going to be involved in their before care, preparing them, and then after care as well. You're going to 
observe them. This is your recovery room nurse observing how they're responding to post anesthesia operation, their pain scale, um, if they have any nausea, vomiting, things that are common and things that are not. Because, you know, again, if you've ever been a part of surgery or yourself or your family member, they cannot leave until they, they are past certain tests. So they, they got to be awake, alert, that sort of thing. They're not going to send somebody home if their pain is like a 12 or something like that. So you guys, now we're going to get into our critical thinking. We've got a small group with us here tonight. Your first question. Which nursing intervention would be most appropriate for a patient taking temazepam? And let me just look at you, Marlette. Can you see my answer? Yay, I fixed it. I just got rid of my second monitor. Uh, put your answers in the chat box. I'm not going to call on anyone tonight. We got a small group. Okay, I lied. I'm going to call on people. Marlette, what'd you put? I put Dean. And the correct answer is tell the patient to ask for help before standing. Mia Moore. He said hi. Hi. And you're probably thinking like, of course you would. But, you know, you don't document it. You don't tell them. They will get up out that bed. I promise you, it wasn't documented. It wasn't done. Patient provided uh, temazepam, one point five milligrams. Was that patient instructed to call before getting standing up? Blah, 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 blah. Can't sue me. You said, oh, you didn't tell me to get up. What would indicate to the nurse that a patient taking a sedative hypnotic requires more teaching from you, the nurse? I'm waiting on a couple more people. Let's go ahead and answer Ms. Patel. I chose letter D. Why would you say D? Um, because Kava Kava is a CAM. And um, when you're taking a medication that is a sedative and a CAM together, it can alter and cause adverse effects. You don't need me anymore. I do need you, actually. I don't know. It's going to fall. No, it's not. I caught it in time. We're good. We're good. Excellent. That's that critical thinking, people. That's it. You got it. You got it. Don't, don't overdo it. Do not overthink it. An adult, an older adult complains of insomnia. Which suggestion would be most appropriate for the nurse to provide as an initial method to deal with this?
I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like this question, but it is what it is. Let me hear from Michelle. Let me not hear from Michelle. Michelle, are you there? A Mitchell? Is it Mitchell or Michelle? A woo woo. I don't think this person. Michelle, Michelle. What about um, Peace? Are you still with us? I don't think so. Okay. I was in between. I know you didn't ask me, but. No, go. I'm asking you now because I don't feel like nobody else. Where is it? Who is on the line before, besides Miss Patel and Miss Bedina? Yes. Um, I was in between. Uh, uh, me. Mm, mm -mm. Who is on the line besides Miss Patel and Miss Medina? Peace, Sham. It's just the two of us here. People have left the show. No, 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 no. Okay. So it looks like it's just Patel and Medina that are with us. All right, you guys. Looks like folks stepped out of, now I gotta get back in my side control, hang on. Anger, anger, uh, 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 uh. We were on a roller, then I did touch something. Can y'all still see the screen? The slides? Yeah. That's something I did. Hang on, hang on. Okay, all right. I wasn't able to see it. All right, it's just the two of us. Looks like other folks dropped out. Mich Michelle is is not. A, okay, all right. We're gonna we're gonna go back and forth. It's fine. All right, give me your answer, dear. Miss Bedina. Um, I was in between. B and C, but let me explain to you why. Oh, please explain to me. My thinking was, um, well, you want you to- that thinking, you scared me. Go ahead, I love it, think. My, was before you want to like give any drug, you want to start with maybe like exercising also helps you get out energy. So I was like, okay, maybe like you could like exercise, you know, like get your energy out. But then I was like, but drinking warm milk, like a little kid, you give them warm milk and then chamomile tea, It we went over it and that one like also helps you like calm down and stuff. And I know that I drink chamomile tea before bed sometimes, like if I'm feeling really anxious or something. Yeah. Yes, I like that explanation. Ms. Patel, did you choose something different? No, I actually chose letter B as well because I recall um, in lab, I think they said that when you're unable to sleep or you do have that insomnia, you want yeah. to kind of sleep on a full stomach or drink something warm before night to kind of calm your nerves. And there you have it. There you have it. Which of the following is the most serious, most serious adverse action of spinal anesthesia. And Ms. Patel, when you're ready, I'll just have you answer. I'm gonna go with B, a headache. Um, and I say that because I've had spinal anesthesia in the form of an epidural in the past and uh -huh. I like got like a really bad headache my friend recently had a spinal tap and she got some sort of she got some sort of spinal anesthetic and she like was unable to stand because of a severe massive oh, headache wow. but I'm going from what I've felt okay and then uh Mitchell are you back with us or Michelle on the iPhone Hello. You want to give us an answer? Uh, I just came back. Um, okay, then you you're going to get the next one. Medina, right. what did you choose? Something different or the same thing? I chose C. 
Because it, I just kind of said the most serious. Most serious, Miss Patel. You might think you wanted to die with that headache. Airway, breathing, circulation. And when they say most serious, to me, headache is serious. Well, it's not serious, but I, I know I, I know what you're saying. When I, I've had patients and friends that have had that type of headache, but you know, if you, can, you can't breathe, then the you you would care less about a headache. I'm just being honest with you. And no, we're not done yet. We're going to go into seizure medications. So we're going to flip. Other people say seizures. Nurses say epilepsy because we're medical people. It's a seizure disorder that messes with the electrical discharges from your cerebral neurons. So it goes into the definition here, loss of consciousness, involuntary uncontrolled movements. If you've ever seen anyone with a seizure in a nurse or not a nurse, it will change your world. They don't, it, it'll just change your world. I remember the first patient I saw as a seizure back in 98 when I was working as an RN, associate's level RN on neurosurg neurology, neuro, ICU floor. Never forget it. Just kept, just, it was violent. <laughs> Derupts, it causes disruption and disruption of the electrical brain functioning, secondary to brain trauma, such as an, an anoxia, which is lack of oxygen, infection, or stroke. There's different things that can bring it on. You can have a stroke. You ever, uh, somebody ever, you ever had a febrile seizure, a child having a febrile seizure or stress? So different things can cause this electrical discharge in your brain to happen. And then the class of medications is called anti-seizure drugs. These stabilize, remember it was unstable, so you need to stabilize those nerve cells and suppress that electrical impulse from happening. So then the specific actions, types of actions are, so you wanna remember sodium, calcium, GABA. Just got to remember some stuff. Sodium influx, calcium influx, suppresses it, stops it, stops the sodium influx, stops the calcium influx, enhances the action of gamma, GABA. Just memorize this slide. You want to know the action, all right? It stops, inhibits, stops sodium from going in. It stabilizes the cell membranes, reduces those firings of those neurons, and that's how the seizures are limited, okay? And then your side effects, if you can think of the action, this is the side effect. I don't know why gingival, which is thickening of the gums, it's just one of those things. Nystagmus happens to do with like your, the, your vision. I can't remember nystagmus. I got to look that up too. Um ataxia as well as far as um and then uh what was it gonna insomnia confusion depression let me look this up really quick ataxia can't remember for some reason i'm having a brain um degenerative disease of the nervous system okay all right so it, it does reduce uh your doctor may recommend speech therapy yes okay Okay. Disrupting your sensory balance as well. A lot of these medications, again, you're you're trying to help one thing, but it's something else gets slighted, so to speak. Uh, did I go backwards? Yeah, I did. Why am I going backwards? Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. Something else gets slighted as well. You know, you might think, oh, you know, hyperglycemia, but you're not having seizures, which could, you know, it's life-threatening for some folks as well. Um, ataxia, which is, you know, if you're, I'm thinking it's like, I think it's like muscle control. We'll have to look it up and see. Um, involuntary muscle control. Oh, okay, side effects. That would make sense as well, because if you're having seizures causes jerking motions, then you're trying to prevent that from happening. Interacts with a few medications. And mostly if I'm looking at this correct, like cimetidine is like tagamet. So your GI medications are listed here and acids, calcium sulcolate, that's GI medicine, your anti-neoplastics, um, 
antineoplastics, I believe that has to do with chemotherapy. But anyway, primrose, ginkgo, borage, do those sound like CAMs to you? Yes, they are. Contraindications in pregnancy, this phenotoin, which is extremely very, it's like old school uh, seizure medication. I remember giving that as LPN. Uh, if they're pregnant, you got to find something else. And then the, there are sort of medications, you they, a therapeutic range, which the doctors look at and they're like, okay, if that patient is 10 to 20, that's where I want them. If they're nine or less than 10, I need to go up. If they're more than 20, I'll get, they're getting too much. And so you want to be aware of different, of their drug levels as well. Barbiturates, believe it or not, are used for folks with seizures as well by enhancing that GABA activity. The types of, there's different types of seizures and for barbiturates, it's phenobarbital, if you wanna remember phenobarbital, but it is a barbiturate. It's used for this certain types of seizures. There's different types, tonic, clonic, partial, they're listed there for you as well. It's very common. If you're noticing the trend, there's your therapeutic range for this particular medication. For me, it makes a great test question. If a patient's uh, taking phenobarbital and their drug level is 45, is, there, is that level therapeutic? No, it is not. It's too much or too little. Side effects, sleepiness, tolerance to get used to that medication slowly tapering a lot of medications you'll find you can't just make people you have to teach them you can't just stop like your antidepressants you can't just stop certain things this is a medication succinamide if i'm pronouncing it ethosuximide again another seizure medication this one specifically works with that calcium influx back of my mind i'm thinking test questions like okay which medication works with decreasing calcium. This is the only one so far that's mentioning calcium, is working with calcium. The other one was talking about GABA. This one talks about calcium. So, um, absence seizures, is used for absence seizure. I guess that's a type of seizure. I personally never heard of it, but if I'm used, working with that particular type of seizure disorder, Calcium, I want to decrease the calcium influx. It also has, believe it or not, a therapeutic range that I would memorize. And of course, everything has side effects as well. Um, I don't think there's anything that doesn't have a side effect to it. Everything, everything, and people need to be aware of. But this is something that um, blood disgracure, disorders of the blood, if somebody has lupus, this is not something that you want to try to give them unless, and suicidal ideations and psychosis. Benzodiazepines, it's used to treat abscess and myoclonic seizures. Tolerance may occur in six months, so therefore they're not trying to use this for a long time. Um, clonazepam, fluorazepate, and diazepam are the three types of benzos, benzos, diazepines that are used to treat certain seizures. Clonazepam is for absence and myoclonic. Chlorazepate is partial and diazepam is used to treat status epilepticus. Diazepam uh, is like so very common. This IV is used with people coming in for seizures and stuff like that. I would make myself a little chart and remember them from that way. Now, if you notice there isn't a therapeutic range for the benzodiazepams, but for the aminostabine, which is carbazepine, which I've heard of, um, used for tonic, clonic, and partial seizures as well. Um, it's also used, so medications are used for different things as well. You can use it by psychiatric disorders. So somebody's bipolarism medication, it might be, not, may not be the first thing they pull, but it can. Some folks, this medication doesn't work. You try this, you'll say, well, I'm going to give you a 
a medication that you that's usually used to treat seizures, but you have time geminal neuralgia, which is um, nerve and dental stuff. So they can use it for, I want to say off-label uses. I've had patients like, oh, well, this is used for this and this. I was like, yeah, but you can use it because you didn't respond to this. So we're kind of running out of options. It has a therapeutic range I would memorize. Another old school one, valporate, valporic acid. It can treat three different types of seizures, tonic, clonic, abscess, and partial. It has a therapeutic range. You want to keep those patients, therapeutic ranges that you want them between this. Just like when you look at lab results and you see a CBC, it's like, oh, it's low in the hemoglobin or that, you know, like, oh, you think anemia. So there's a range. And uh, providers that give these medications, they're, you're going to be like, oh, we got to draw your blood in the morning. We're going to check your levels. You're going to have to adjust this, that, or the other. The doctor may adjust this, that, and the other. As a nurse, you want to look it up before you give to the patient to see what their range is. You want to just know. You can. That's part, I would document it. You know, viporic acid, 10 milligrams um, given for a serum range of 51 or something like that. Just, it shows that you are aware that you looked at it. So nobody would say, you did you look at it? Side effects listed for you, drowsiness, weakness, insomnia. Diplopia, I think that's vision, something like seeing double. I think that's seeing double. Suicide ideation, thrombocytopenia, low um, clotting factors, I believe. Pregnancy. Whenever I have a patient that comes in and you, again, you're taking their history, there are certain medications that you, you know, they just cannot have in pregnancy. You know, mom or baby, which one comes first, you know? sort of thing. They all are important. You have two patients, but you cannot take that medication anymore that you're pregnant. You have to send them to a specialist. They got to find something else. Um, so a third of females with seizure disorders are at greater risk in pregnancy. And all that means literally is that in women of childbearing age, if they have a seizure disorder and they can get pregnant, they're with a partner, female partner, you don't have to worry about it. You want to educate and offer them contraception because this medication that you're on is great for you, but it will not be great for an unborn child. And 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. So you do that education, you document that you talk to them about it as well. Um, teratogenic means that it was it's not good for a growing fetus. They have drug classes. So, um, Whenever I give medications to a woman of childbearing age, even if it's a antibiotic, I look, I already have certain things in the back of my mind. I'm like, she's not going to get that. She's not going to get that. We can get that because, you know, especially if I know she's not on contraception. And then the anti-seizure drugs can inhibit or prevent or stop the vitamin K, which is used for clotting. Uh, it contributes to infant hemorrhage soon after birth. So you really, it's really like a, a woman that has history of epilepsy or any 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 of those conditions to where, like, let's say lupus, where you know that they're on medications that are probably not safe. Let's say cancer, they're a cancer patient, for example. You just got to be like, what are you taking? Are you, how are we preventing pregnancy? that sort of thing you have that and make sure that they're on folate which is uh prevents birth defects spinal bifida and encephalopathy and that sort of thing it's a lot of a lot of things we do in nursing are preventative focus we're thinking we think it we're thinking ways to prevent things from happening so if you have a 21 year old she's diagnosed with epilepsy you want to have that conversation with her like these medications are great for you but if you're planning on getting pregnant Anytime soon, we really need to we need to think about contraception. And what are, what are your what are your thoughts? It's their decision. We live in a free democracy. Status epilepticus is a medical emergency. Treatment must begin immediately. Okay, and then um, what was that actor that died? Uh, he was in. 
Oh, don't help me. Oh, I can see his face too. Ooh. He had a static epileptic seizure in his sleep. Oh, also, um, I don't know why I can't think of that right now. I can't think of it. It's okay. All right. All right. So it's an emergency and usually it's IV medications that they're, um, that they're giving because it needs to be quick and fast acting. And then, um, So the IV to avoid respiratory distress is usually given slowly over a period of, of hours usually, but it's a medical emergency. So then it affects the intracranial regulation, those neurons in the brain, you get your history, there's lab values, you want to check how their liver is functioning, their ki kidney is functioning. All of those are things that... Um, will be ordered for you. So then you just want to be aware of these things. Oh, Juice World. That was one of the, I was thinking of another, an actor, but Juice World also. He was walking down, uh, I think Chicago O'Hare. He had a, a seizure status called ellipticus right as he was walking. In. I don't know if you remember that, about three years ago, I think. Um, Analyze cues, prioritize hypothesis. So again, it's always like, okay, you know that this side effect is going to happen. They're, um, when someone's in a seizure, if they've experienced it, they're high risk for injuring themselves and to educate and teach it. And more so too with the family as well. A lot of these medications, they have therapeutic levels and just know, I don't, just know that. Uh, Patients, some female patients, female patients taking oral contraceptions and anti-seizure drugs um, to use additional contraception methods. So even then, um, especially with the, uh, this really delves into like certain, the like certain pills, most, most of the birth control pills um, can lower the effectiveness. So um, just be aware that it, it for me, Personally, if I have someone that has a seizure disorder, and I've, I've worked with uh, pregnant, I mean, women with seizure disorders before, usually we try to talk them into like a Nexplanon or an IV or uh, IUD, not the oral. A, they could stop taking it or forget it. And then that sort of thing. But just know, it specifically says the oral medication. So I would just know that. And then we're going to get into our last set of critical thinking. Number one. Number one, before administering a daily dose of pheno phenotoin, what is most important for the nurse to do? And Michelle, are you with this again? Or I'm, I don't think so. I think it's just Medina and Patel. I'll have Ms. Patel answer when she's ready. I'm ready. Okay. Um, I'm going to choose B, check phenotone levels, because there's a serum therapeutic level or whatever that number was. I don't know the numbers, but yeah. Excellent. No, you don't You don't know the numbers, but you know that you need to be checking it. And that is an excellent start from learning that five minutes ago. Miss Medina, a patient was discharged three days ago on phenotone therapy for drug seizure, for seizure disorder. The patient comes to the emergency department experiencing seizures. What would be the most, most value to determine the etiology? Etiology means cause. Okay, I'm gonna go with C. I don't know. You do know. You know more than you think you know. It's so, don't, I promise you, I promise you, don't let it confuse you because what it's saying here, they were discharged three days ago on phenotoin. He comes in three days later experiencing seizures. What would be the most value? Value. Value is something that has worth. If you're not able to eliminate 
E, uh, B and D. I'm going to pray for you. You need to eliminate, you need to, and uh, four questions, you four possible answers, you need to elim eliminate two right away. And so you should have been able to rapidly, if you didn't eliminate D, my heart is just, I don't know. So electrolytes, and you need to eliminate EEG, okay? We didn't even talk about either of those, but anyway, I mean, then you're like, okay, a CAT scan. Doesn't tell me CAT scan of anything. This is a CAT scan. And I know for me, I'm like, CAT scan of what? <laughs> That's the type of person I am. You didn't tell me what you're doing a CAT scan for. That's the first thing I noticed. But even if it's a CAT scan of the brain, uh that's not going to give me the most value. If they were discharged on this medication, you would think they would have done the levels beforehand, but we can't assume any of that. We don't know when the last time they got the levels checked. So for me, the most value to determine the etiology of the return of the return seizures for me and nurse and when I was a nurse and especially nurse practitioner. I'm like, when I have somebody with diabetes and I'm like, oh, okay, so how are you taking your medicine? What do you mean? Like, tell me, how you how'd you take it yesterday? It's something so easy. I'm like, uh-uh, you're supposed to take that at night or something like so simple, so simple. In nursing, do you guys know that acronym KISS? Have y'all heard of KISS? Oh, okay, let me indoctrinate you. KISS, keep it simple. And I'll let you make that last S whatever you want it to be. It's so simple. It's so simple. You draw their blood level. Everybody that goes to ER going to get their blood levels drawn. Going to get their blood drawn. Everybody. You can do a pregnancy test off the blood if you wanted to. I don't, most people think they're just, you can do so much with a good drop of blood. I want to know what, I want to know what your, your, your phenotoin levels are specifically. And then I might do a CAT scan. I, I don't know, but you got to tell me what you're doing a CAT scan of. It doesn't tell you specifically what you're doing a CAT scan of. So that's the thing like, I didn't even tell you. Pe most people would have missed that like CAT scan. And you checked it. I'm like, but it didn't tell you what they were doing a CAT scan of. So we don't assume or speculate. And that's not very nursey, but we can we, we we can draw blood for the phenotone levels. We'll get orders in the ER. Sometimes you'll see them draw blood if the lab's too busy. And with that, we are done. It goes by so quickly, but believe it or not, we did a full.